Today we're joined by Jaron Lukasavich. He's the founder and CEO of Coinsetter, a new exchange that's coming into the Bitcoin space. We've been going through kind of an interesting time from a regulatory standpoint, and there are a lot of different views on how best to approach this and, and really how important even the question is. So, you know, Jaron, you're kind of the prototypical entrepreneur in the Bitcoin space, and I really I, I'm, I appreciate you sitting down to have this conversation with us. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested and then involved in the cryptocurrency space? I worked in investment banking and private equity out of college. Um, I think towards the end of that, I got very interested in the startup space in general. Um, I had already started another company with my brother and a friend of mine. This friend ended up later helping me co-found Coinsetter. Really, for a long time, had been talking about Bitcoin, really got me interested in it to begin with. We ended this other company that we had started late in 2012. I was in the online ticketing industry. And, you know, I think it was pretty obvious at that time that I wanted to do something in the Bitcoin space. So, you know, I worked really hard on putting together this company. You know, it was a lot of late nights. First, you know, figuring out specifically what I wanted to do in the space. And, you know, once I had kind of figured that out, of course, the space was much different back then. You know, I think it was obviously much smaller. I was pretty much at that time creating a leveraged trading platform for play money. At least that's what my friends thought. You know, the space has changed a lot since then. So, you know, we raised this capital uh, earlier this year from a group of highly regarded investors. And that really enabled us to go out and create a really quality product, which is, is what we've done. And we're in the final stages of putting that together and releasing it to the public. So, you know, I think a big difference between what we were initially creating and what we have now is whereas before it really was a, a leverage platform for play money and, you know, Mt. Gox was doing $10 million of monthly volume at the time. Now, I think people's vision of Bitcoin has has become much bigger. So now we're building really a Wall Street style ECN trading platform for Bitcoin, which you know aggregates the feeds of multiple exchanges. We have our own internal high performance exchange, which operates on a millisecond level. And you know, it's really about being a reliable place to trade within the US. And and you know, on the other side of that is regulatory issues that we're confronting right now. And uh, that's something we're taking very seriously. I can't say too many specifics on certain parts of it, but there is light at the end of the tunnel as far as, you know, us being able to legally operate in the U.S. Uh, in the next few months. You came to startups, it sounds like, before you necessarily came to Bitcoin. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so why do you view Bitcoin as an entrepreneurial opportunity? What problems does it solve? What opportunities does it present that make it attractive as someone who came at this from the startup space first? Well, you know, Bitcoin's a funny thing when uh, you really look at trying to start a business around it because the problem about Bitcoin from an entrepreneurial perspective is that the greatest innovation in Bitcoin is Bitcoin. And and so, you know, you have this very interesting, secure virtual currency, you start to think, okay, well, how, how can I make money off of this? Because I want to go start a company and I'm, I like doing that. You know, I think that can be a hard thing because, you know, the exchange concept is pretty obvious. Becoming a payment processor is pretty obvious. And I think people try to get more creative outside of that. Really, it is that payment network that is the true innovation. So, you know, I think for me, I first got interested in Bitcoin for Bitcoin. I looked at it and it just, I think it, it meshes with a lot of my political views. I'm interested in finance in general. And so it had a lot of appeal to me personally. I knew I wanted to start an industry in it and I really just worked hard to say, okay, well, what do I think is missing? And at that time, it was basically a great Forex platform for Bitcoin. You know, I mean, uh, having to wire money to a foreign country just you know, with a bad looking front end, uh, you know, it was just kind of a not a great process at the time. And so I, I thought I could do it better. And we've even outdone my own expectations at this point. So are there any aspects to it that make it that make it unattractive or make it difficult to deal with from an entrepreneurial standpoint? Well, the regulation's a big one because it changes so quickly. You really have to stay on top of it. And I see a lot of other exchanges come out and, you know, we've all seen a lot of Bitcoin companies not take the regulation thing seriously or early enough. They've been truly harmed by it. it I mean, it almost amazes me how how early companies in the space just, I mean, they didn't even think they would have to do AML procedures. Like, I mean, I think that's pretty crazy, but the space is changing a lot. I mean, you have a lot of people who are saying, hey, Bitcoin is a way to quickly send money to your friends. It has all these great benefits. How can I make it more easily usable by the common person? And we and other companies have kind of popped up trying to solve that specific problem. And Bitcoin 
does provide great infrastructure to build companies off of. You know, I think there's room in the space for a lot of exchanges, for instance. I think what most people think in exchanges, you know, most people think an exchange is a trading platform. And in five years, that won't be the case. Most exchanges will be working closely with app developers, banks, financial institutions, other companies like that. And they'll be in the business of converting fiat to Bitcoins, which are then quickly sent somewhere else so that you can pay your friends quickly. It's really exciting. And, and there's, there's definitely a lot of interest and the infrastructure isn't quite there yet, you know, in order to facilitate that, that system. But over the next five years, I think this should become a very exciting thing and it'll change the financial landscape quite a bit. So I have a couple of statements here that are either true or false, basically, or you basically just agree or disagree. If you want to expand on any of them, then we can do that. Point one, person to person transactions are desirable in a financial system. True. Okay. Global markets need borderless money or at least benefit from borderless money. True. Sensitive financial information is vulnerable in conventional internet payment paradigms. True. Okay. So these are things that broadly speaking, most people within the Bitcoin network think are really are good things about Bitcoin. But there are other things about Bitcoin, you know, like uh, the anonymous nature of it or pseudonymous nature of it. It comes up every once in a while. Um, are there any parts of Bitcoin that you deal with as an entrepreneur working in the space despite, you know, you deal with Bitcoin despite this part, not, uh, you know, because it has these other advantages? Yeah. You know, I, I think people in the space struggle a lot with the anonymous, pseudonymous nature of Bitcoin. And I think it doesn't sound great to say this, but a lot of people want to have their cake and eat it too. So, you know, you have people who say, okay, Bitcoin isn't an anonymous cash system and people will be able to figure out over the long run where payments are going. But then, you know, anytime people talk about that existing, they say, no, we can't have that. So for me, one of the great parts about Bitcoin is the fact that it toes that line. You can talk all day about, you know, we Bitcoin will will survive no matter what. And that's true to an extent. But Bitcoin, if Bitcoin's viewed by banks and regulators as an anonymous cash system, it will essentially be closed off from society. It can never become a, a really powerful force. I, I'm more focused on how can I pay my friends in 10 minutes? There are other, I think, benefits of Bitcoin that kind of have to separate Bitcoin companies from Bitcoin itself. So people who hold Bitcoin themselves will be privy to much more privacy than people who hold money with Bitcoin companies. So, you know, I think that kind of fits into, I don't know, one of the parts that got a lot of us excited about Bitcoin. It's more, it's almost a system you vote into. You, you make the decision to join it. If you don't like it, maybe you switch to another altcoin. Like it, it's all at your own elective. And I think the fact that Bitcoin isn't strictly anonymous is a huge plus because, you know, we've seen over and over again for the past 25 years that companies that are looked upon as anonymous cash systems get shut down. You know, it's certainly, even though I am an entrepreneur in the space, I'm also very passionate about Bitcoin. I want to see it not just survive, but I want to see it thrive. That, that's what really drives me every day. So I have a couple of sort of opposing statements here that I'm, I'm curious for your, which one you, you find yourself with more. On the importance of compliance, uh, statement A, Bitcoin will succeed regardless of governmental action uh, versus point B, Bitcoin must be fully integrated and compliant with existing financial networks to be viable in anything but the short term. Obviously, I side toward B. I mean, the cool thing about Bitcoin is, is it is kind of powerful force because of the distributed network. Uh, it is here to stay. But the question is, is how how big and impactful can it actually become? Like, do we want it off in the corners looked upon as just the sketchy type of currency? Or do we want real people being able to use Bitcoin and receiving a lot of the benefits it offers? And so in order for that to happen, you have to have at least Bitcoin companies have to comply with regulation. They have to get bank accounts. You can't have any sort of large sums of money flow into Bitcoin if it's not through the banking system. Uh, it'll, it'll never happen peer to peer, like an in-person meeting. So that's really what, what we're trying to do. You're to be forgiven for focusing very much so on the U.S. regulatory side as you have a company doing business within that exact sphere of regulatory influence. But this is another question within the community is how important is the U.S. relative to the rest of the world? And so this brings us to the next grouping. Proposition A, acceptance or lack thereof in the U.S. will be a deciding factor in the future success of Bitcoin versus Proposition B, acceptance or lack thereof in the U.S. will be a deciding factor in the future development of Bitcoin in the U.S. 
So the differentiation there is that one implies that the U.S. dictates and the other implies that the U.S. is just deciding its own fate. There's some validity in my view to, you know, U.S. acceptance having a a strong impact. But in the end, I think we have it. There are very positive indicators that Bitcoin is being accepted by the government. I think even more so than the regulation, it comes down to people. So what kind of people enter the space and start companies and and talk to regulators? I think a a lot of what's happened in the past in this space is a lot of people like to say that they're in active conversations with regulators and law enforcement officials and so forth. But, you know, maybe they've talked to them once. You know, it's like a great talking point. We can be doing a lot more. And also it's what products you create around Bitcoin. We are super focused about not launching before we're ready. I see other exchanges popping up that are, you know, launching, kind of towing the line of legality and launching in jurisdictions with which they don't really have licensing in. And that's their decision to make. But in the end, you know, by waiting the extra month, we're looking at, at this as a marathon. And you know, by doing things the right way, talking to bankers, talking to regulators, explaining to them why they don't need to be scared of Bitcoin. And it's a combination of those things that help move it forward. But in the end, it comes more down to people than it does like even the Bitcoin protocol, you know, who is talking to regulators, who is starting a business and so forth. So now we've been talking about Bitcoin, but there's a broader question here of the future, not just of Bitcoin, but of of the cryptocurrencies, which Bitcoin is the most popular of, but is kind of getting to be a large category of these two statements. Which do you think is more true? A, Bitcoin success or failure will depend on the fate of other cryptocurrencies. If Bitcoin succeeds, some altcoins will also succeed. If Bitcoin fails, then altcoins, broadly speaking, will probably fail. Or Bitcoin's experience, whether successful or not, will catalyze and inform the next generation of altcoins. Their success or failure isn't really tied at all to Bitcoin. That's a good question. Call me biased, but I don't even question Bitcoin's existence. I think it's here to stay and it's super useful. There are obviously people who want it. So Bitcoin or maybe it's just virtual currencies in general like that, something that's here to stay. People often ask themselves, is Bitcoin it? I think so, but I could be proven wrong. But you know, when you look at the VC money that's being poured into Bitcoin specifically, um, the infrastructure that's being built around Bitcoin specifically, you know, Bitcoin is an IP address for money. And uh, when you go back into the early days of the internet and you look at TCP IP, I mean, there were 20 other uh, competing, I, you know, uh, uh, technologies that basically did the same thing. But TCP IP was the option that caught on most broadly. And that, that's what you're seeing happen with Bitcoin right now. People are, are very focused on the currency aspect, which is an important aspect of it. But, you know, I'm really focused on the network aspect and how can a Bitcoin address facilitate dollar payments. And that's what we are doing as an exchange over the long run. And other exchanges are doing that. So the infrastructure definitely Definitely, really the money flowing it, the entrepreneurial efforts that are happening really lead me to believe that Bitcoin is it. And can Bitcoin change? Possibly. Will other currencies potentially come up? You know, I think Ripple's already shown that there are other options out there that may be good for certain scenarios. So, you know, it's hard to say, but I, I'm putting my money on Bitcoin. And then last question, and this one is always controversial. (laughs) So if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. But I'm very curious to know what you think. You know, you've worked in the financial industry. You worked for a time as a trader at JP Morgan. Uh, People question whether or not the existing financial system as it currently is, is very compatible with Bitcoin. And compliance aside, the larger question is Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies represent, especially if they pick up adoption, competition to legacy or government currencies in a way that we've never really seen in our lifetime. And I I can't really think of of any generation that has. Do you think that there is a fundamental disconnect here or that there's there's a conflict here? Or do you think that they can integrate and it'll be clean? You know, I think that's how the the way you ask that question is how most people look at it currently. But I think it's the complete opposite of how we should be looking at the situation. So it's not will the banking sector adapt to Bitcoin? Like, I mean, the banking sector is what it is. And it it has a system that at least works. It works terribly, but it works for them and they make money off of it. And so in order for the banking system to accept a new technology that may be better, there has to be something in it for them. Bitcoin certainly offers that part because 
because of the Bitcoin address and the fact that it is really a public system that does have value to banks that pretty much no one is talking right now. I actually just read a call in Bitcoin magazine that kind of touches upon it. I think, you know, Bitcoin, it can be its own thing. You know, you're, you're holding Bitcoins, it, you know, really is like your own private Swiss bank account out and you have this great currency that is that is yours but that's not all that bitcoin has to be so when i look at you know bitcoins how will they impact the banking system i take more of a look at how does the wire system work how does the ach system work what's correspondent banks place in that system and why is it so expensive to send these transfers and why does it take so long those are issues that I think are important to confronting. And I think Bitcoin, I already see solutions that Bitcoin offers to fix a lot of those problems so that my real goal in in what I'm doing is you should be able to send a million dollars to a sketchy place in Romania and have it arrive there in an hour fully BSA compliant. You know, so it's, it really is about, you know, free flow of money across borders at an affordable price. You know, you mentioned a one million dollar amount with full compliance, and I think that that makes sense. But I wonder if it makes sense about ten dollar transactions or fifty dollar transactions. Do you think that we'll wind up with a two tiered system where there's like a threshold above which there are there are these compliance requirements because they make sense and they're effective at that level? But that doesn't tie up uh, all of the, the lower end with this stuff that doesn't necessarily make as much sense. I think what you're going to see happen is that it's not really going to matter how big or small a transaction was. The compliance cost for Bitcoin is, is just low. A lot of that stuff hasn't been built yet, but over the next five to 10 years, it, it will be built. If you can kind of have certainty that you're sending money to a, a safe Bitcoin address in a foreign country, no matter where it was, there's no reason why you couldn't send money over the Bitcoin protocol from your bank account to that bank account. So those are things that are definitely further out, but they're possible and they're really exciting because I think enough of us have seen how difficult it is just to send money to your friends. Or if you own a business, if you send money across borders, it can cost $75 just for the transaction. And you think about the AML compliance that needs to go on behind that. A lot of this is just manual labor that banks are doing. And it's very prone to human error too. I'm focused when I kind of think about the direction that we want to take Coinsetter. It's very much on that note. It sounds to me like what you're saying is that from this perspective, Bitcoin is actually improving the efficiency and reducing costs and you know mistakes at the banks, but you're still using those banks in order to make the transactions, just that the bank is then using this as the underlying means as opposed to like a SWIFT or a wire transfer or something like that. Is that right? Exactly. And uh, who knows what, you know, I, I, it's not to say that those other options won't even exist. Like Bitcoin might be a different transaction option. Maybe, you know, it's I think one question that happens in the Bitcoin space is will Bitcoin companies be forced to create reversibility in transactions? So irreversible remains in the protocol. But are Bitcoin companies subject to you know reversing it? And it's really hard to say at this point how this would play out in the banking system. But just think about a world where you could send money to your friend and you could have the option between a wire transfer, which costs $35, an ACH transfer, which costs $3, and your friend needs to set up an account on your bank's website, and then it'll arrive to them in three days, or a Bitcoin transfer, which will arrive almost immediately and is irreversible, but cheap. You know, Maybe you limit that to $100 or $500 or something. There's so much creativity that can happen here. That's why it's really exciting. And it's not to say that there aren't reasons why you wouldn't want to send a a reversible transaction even over the Bitcoin protocol if it's of a large sum. There are a lot of arguments that we'll be able to make to banks that will will show huge value proposition to them. So when I kind of talk about these things, you know, people are always trying to think about when they're, you know, looking to start their Bitcoin business, people are trying to think of these gimmicky ideas that, oh, you know, what what can people buy Bitcoins with? Or how can I use Bitcoin in this creative payments way? But there are some really glaringly large opportunities here, such as Could I create an escrow service that you can transfer Bitcoins from and to, but denominated in uh, in dollars? In fact, I think I saw someone created an Android app like this. I mean, that's just a very awesome example of where all this is heading. That you can carry balances in dollars, but then send money to your friends in Bitcoin. And you think about as more people use a system like that, you'll have logistics companies that are similar to correspondent banks pop up that you know make this system even smoother. It's just really exciting to me where all this is heading. In a compliant future, do people still make 
transactions from person to person? Or do you think that compliant Bitcoin transactions, in order to meet that burden of compliance, can only really go through banks? And that banks can use Bitcoin, you can have the efficiencies of it there, but that we won't see it used for legitimate purposes person to person. Hmm. My initial response is that there's no reason to limit ourselves to a better option. So I think, you know, PP payments are going to be huge in the Bitcoin space. I think that, you know, sending money from your bank account via Bitcoin is, is another great option and they'll kind of fit with each other. Does the one preclude the other? No, I don't think it does. And that, that's why it's so exciting. One unfortunate thing about the banking industry is that banks used to be their primary business yeah. function was to protect money, protect deposits. And now their primary business function is to figure out where money is going and keep track of it. You know, I leave that to everyone to figure out if you agree that it's necessary or not. But that's the main reason why banking is so costly these days. It's a lot of it's in AML compliance. I think Bitcoin has some options in there that will really help smooth the system over. And you know, again, I'm, I'm looking at things very much from a kind of like banking perspective and services we can offer to, to banks to make it easier for people to send money to their friends from their bank account. But the P2P side, I mean, I, I send money to friends and Bitcoins all the time. And I, I prefer when they send it to me because we all know that the Bitcoins are gold and much rather have them than dollars. So a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. They all look at Bitcoin in a different way. I think that it's almost hard to predict everywhere where this will go. Jaron, CEO of Coinsetter, thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot. Hi, Stephanie here. Would you like to turn your book into an enthralling audiobook? Need a persuasive commercial to promote your company? How about a narrator for your explainer video? Here's where I can help. I'm a freelance voiceover artist, and since 2009, I've lent my voice to dozens of audio projects. To hear some examples of my work, check out my website, smvoice.info. If you like what you hear, I'd love to be the voice of your next project. Get in touch at smvoice.info.